Good to see you guys. Mission. I only saw a few people get up and start dancing during that intro, so so good to be here. Uh, I remember hearing that song uh, early in life. I got ready for a big night out when I was in about fifth grade. I put on my Adidas sneakers, put on a, a gold chain, put in the gel in my hair. I hopped in the car with my mom, the minivan, and we made our way to Champ's Roller Dome. Uh, I didn't know that you had a roller dome. Literally, I could throw a rock and hit it. That's crazy. I haven't been to a roller dome in, in, in so many years. I was 11 years old, and I was totally unprepared for what I was about to encounter. I walked into the door with a sea of fifth, sixth, seventh graders. I went up to rent my skates. They had two options, the brown boots or the speed skates. So I pulled out a couple extra bucks. I rented the speed skates because I wanted to look fly, right? And so I laced them up and I quickly became overwhelmed. I had never skated before in my life. <laughs> the DJ was up in the booth. Uh, yes, there was a booth up taking songs, the tower, requests from songs, and he was calling out these different skates. I remember the backwards skate. And I looked at that and I said, nope, that's not me. I can't go forward, let alone backwards. So I stood on the side, that little railing, and looked over at everybody else who could skate backwards. He then called out a couple's skate. I looked around. I winked a few times at some ladies. They did not reciprocate. And so I watched as everybody else couple skated. Then the jam skate. Do you remember this? California Love, Tupac and Dre started to play, and people are like jam skating. They're like... Have you seen this? No? Nobody else roller skated. Okay, just me. I was so intimidated. It was my first night ever. I'm in fifth grade, and I am frozen on the sidelines until finally the DJ, thank you, DJ, play my song, called that all skate, where everyone from every walk of life and every bit of experience could enjoy a skate together as you shuffle down the all skate around the car. Everybody is heading in the different, and everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect, right? Anything is possible. There is hope for everyone with skates on their feet. And we started to skate and move in the same direction. That all skate that night in fifth grade saved my life and equipped me and developed my skating skills. For a few short months later, my mom would buy me my very own speed skates. We're in a series mission called All Skate, and I'm so humbled to be here together. Uh, my name is Brent Bramer, and I get to serve as the lead pastor and church planner at Slow City Church in San Luis Obispo, just up the coast. So good to be here with you, those in the room, those online, those in the lobby. Um, we have been in this series together as a church, talking about who you are, who we are collectively as the church, and where we are headed, and this is an All Skate. No matter your level of experience, no matter if it's the first time you walked in the door, like we're all discussing the values, where we are headed together as the church. So far, you've talked about being people marked by tangible hope, a collection of people marked by bringing real practical help to your neighbor, to your city, pursuing and living out life-changing ministry inside and outside the walls of the church. To be people who throw great parties. Jesus was a great party thrower, a great party goer. And today, we're going to talk about being people marked by kingdom impact. Series like this are super important because you and I, we all need clarity and direction. Where there is no clarity, there is no peace. There is no purpose. There is no momentum. Proverbs 11 verse 4 says this, Without good direction, people lose their way. Sounds simple, but it is powerful. Direction is vital to unity, to mission, and to growth, especially in a time and culture when it seems like everything is so confusing. There is a lack of clarity. There are things, people calling out things from the booth that you're like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know where we're going. There's all of these inconsistent directions. We're kind of all skating right now culturally towards an election. Did you know that something's happening on Tuesday? Are you allowed to say election admission? I, I just did. I'm sorry. Don't throw something at me. There seems to be this vortex of energy to, to pull us in this way or that way or up way or down way or sideways. Like we are pulled in all of these different directions in this election season. Have you felt it? This political machine, it demands our attention. It says, look at me. 
It tempts our affections. It says, trust me. Have you felt that? What do we do in this season? Where do we go in this season? What's going to happen? Who will we become in this season? We're all skating in a world that is deeply charged politically and, to, and seems to ask us, woo us, to trust it. It is in seasons like this where it is so vital for the church, Jesus' people to talk about Jesus' things and lead into the voice of Jesus that says, hey, skate this way, even if it's a shuffle. Skate this way. Come this way. We're going to all skate this way. Jesus leads us in, in the direction of kingdom impact. I want you to know this. If you remember, Jesus, 2,000 years ago, stepped into a world that was like yours, like mine, deeply political. He lived in a deeply political world, right in the midst of it. It was a time of great confusion, great chaos. It was demanding. It was what everybody talked about. It was a super dangerous political climate. And right in the midst of it, Jesus lived, Jesus led, Jesus did ministry, Jesus spoke. There were all of these differing voices, differing pulls on the heart. Every group was vying for something from the people. There were the Pharisees. We read about them often. They get a pretty bad rap in scripture, but really they were relatively conservative individuals who sought the most righteous and religious outcome. Sometimes their religion poisoned them. There were the Sadducees, they were these crafty political maneuverers who sought uh, to protect their power and privilege at all cost. There were the zealots, religious mil military, like m religious zealots or militia almost, who had military dreams of revolutionary violence and political overthrow. There were the pagans or the Gentiles. They were just consumed with their own self-gratification. I'll just go along with whatever, what feels good to me, what makes me feel most pleasure. It was this deeply humanistic way of viewing life. There were the Romans. They were empire builders who taxed, threatened, oppressed the occupied countries that they were in and the country that Jesus lived. Then there were the Essenes. They were escapists to the desert. They saw the culture at large and they were deeply gutted over it. And they said, you know what? We're going to move to the desert. We're going to create isolated communities away from it all. Anybody tempted just to move to the desert? Not the valley, but the desert. You know, I'm joking. And then there are the ordinary. Just average Joe kind of people. Trying to put bread on their table. Trying to make enough money. Trying to make sense of life that were impacted by all of these different groups and all of these different opinions. Jesus, in the midst of this, he feels the temperature. He hears the rhetoric and he gets the temptation. He gets the pull and the demand on everybody's attention. And he, he's in the midst of this and, 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 and he does something incredible. I wanna, I wanna just define these terms really quick. That word political means um, relating to the government. It, that word is kind of derived from a Latin word that speaks to the science and discipline of citizens working together. To politic is to relate to other people. And the government was intended to politic, to govern, to exercise sovereign authority over people, assisting in societal relations, how societies function. It was intended to create healthy societies. The government is the thing, the entity, or a person that has authority over people. Now you might ask, why in the world is this guy coming down from San Luis Obispo talking about politics? What does Jesus have to do with politics? Well, again, Jesus lives in a deeply political world, and Jesus preached a deeply political gospel. Jesus deeply cared about the people in the crosshairs of all the political chaos. And Jesus preached a political gospel. I want us to get this. Jesus proclaimed a political message, but not like you and I would expect. He proclaimed a message about a governing authority, a sovereign rule and reign, but not like you and I understand today. Matthew chapter 4, it says, Jesus began to preach, and he said, Repent, turn your heart to God, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues and he proclaimed, proclaimed the good news or the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus comes in his first message on the planet as he is doing ministry, is he, is he is sharing the good news about a good kingdom, a good authority, a government that would rule and reign, but not a human government, not a man-made kingdom, that would rise and fall every four years. We'd be all up in arms about it. He came proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of heaven that would never turn over, that would never falter, that would never hurt its citizens, that would never, that would never become corrupt. Jesus comes and he says, there is a way where God is making his way to the earth. The good news right now, everybody, this is what Jesus is proclaiming, is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It is here. It is close. It is tangible. It is touchable. You can understand life. You can understand relationships. You can posture your hearts because good news, the kingdom of heaven is here. Brian Zahn shared this, the kingdom of God is all that the kingdom of Satan is opposed to. Instead of rivalry, there is to be love. Instead of accusation, there is to be advocacy. Instead of violence, there is to be peace. Instead of domination, there is to be liberation. Instead of maintaining the vicious cycle of beastly empire, Jesus comes to establish a humane kingdom come from heaven. This is the gospel Jesus brings about the kingdom ways of God and the flourishing of humanity that comes with it. What is the kingdom of heaven like? It is when there is human flourishing. It is where addictions are broken. It is where the lame are healed. And Jesus shows up and he says, guys, look, look at me. Good news. It's here. It's not over there. It's not in the desert. It's not up there. It's not over here. All these people are vying for your attention. I'm going to tell you, God is king. He is ruling and reigning, and the kingdom of God is breaking through on the planet. This way, this message was different than anything than anyone had ever seen or experienced, and yet everyone longed for it. Everyone longed for this good government. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus went through Galilee. He taught in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. He healed every disease and sickness among the people. That's what happens in the kingdom of God. And the news started spreading about him all over Syria. People were bringing to Jesus all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and Jesus healed them. Large crowds from all over Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed after Jesus. In the midst, a deeply political world, Jesus shows up and he says, I've got some politics to discuss. I want to point you to a kingdom that will never fail. And it's here right now. And here's what it looks like. Those, are, those who are suffering, they're met with mercy. Those who are lost and confused and conflicted and standing on the sidelines looking on, you can skate too. Let me show you what it looks like to walk. He gave food to the hungry. He gave us a whole direction. And people were experiencing life in the kingdom of God. Some were Romans. Some were zealots. Some were former Pharisees. Some were just ordinary people and broken people. They're all coming from different places and different perspectives. And he showed them a kingdom of heaven, a kingdom of God way. And people are all spun up. This is the best thing ever. And then, I love this. Uh, Jesus' disciples come to him, and you, we've talked about stories of Jesus. Jesus walked on water. Jesus calmed the storm. Jesus gave sight to the blind. Jesus uh, prayed demons out of this guy, sent him into some pigs, and then he saw pigs fly and jumped into the, like, and so his disciples come to him, and they say, Jesus, if you could just teach us one thing, one thing, and I'm expecting walk on water, pigs fly, flip over tables in the temple, teach us something. They say, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray. Jesus ushers in the kingdom of God and then encouraged those who followed after him to pray for the kingdom to come. Pray for the kingdom of come. This is what you want and need. This is what you desire, God's ways of goodness and grace, truth and love, God's heart, his rule and reign. So Jesus says, 
pray. If you want to know how to pray, I want to teach you to pray like this. And then if you know this prayer, I invite you to pray it with me. Matthew 6, verse 9. This then is how you should pray, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it goes on. What do your prayers seek? I was reading this, the Lord's Prayer, this past week, and I just kind of looked in the mirror and said, Brent, what do your prayers, what do my prayers pursue? Are my prayers kingdom-centric or self-centric? I don't know if that's a word. Kingdom-ish or self-ish? Robert Putnam, in his book, Bowling Alone, discusses the reality culturally that we are at the height of what he calls cultural narcissism. And he's not a follower of Jesus, but he talks about the use of the, use of the words I, me, my, mine has exploded in the past 40 years. And this trend has been charted and traced throughout literature, film, entertainment, politics, news sources, and even, and even in faith. The concern of me, mine, I, over we, us, together, can deeply impact a culture at large, and it can deeply impact our faith and our prayers. I can often approach God in prayer in an effort or an agenda to build my kingdom. Have you found that to be true in your life? And don't get me wrong, God wants to hear what you need, what you want, your frustrations. He says, pour out your hearts. I hear your prayer. I care about you. He welcomes it. But Jesus teaches us to pray not for my kingdom, but for your kingdom, his kingdom. Not mine, but yours, God. And the first followers of Jesus start praying, your kingdom come, your kingdom come, your kingdom come. Do you know what happens when you pray for things? Your legs, whether you like it or not, they start to follow after your prayers. And the first followers of Jesus learn that they put legs on their prayers. They follow after their prayers. Your kingdom come, so I want to see the kingdom come. Jesus taught and told and modeled and empowered first followers of Jesus to share the kingdom to take the kingdom, to pray the kingdom, but then to share the kingdom with everyone, everywhere. What do you share most? What do you share with your friends most, your family most? Uh, we, we are in a time where it's really easy to share things with everyone. I, I saw something this past week that uh, my stepmother shared, and I said, uh, i I." I don't think I would have shared that. You know, they're going to look back on that and be like, I overshared uh, that post on social media or whatever. Yeah, you know, like we're in a time where it's really easy at a click of a button, you can share it with the world, right? And this is the basis of sharing social media, sharing our lives with one another. Here's me at the pumpkin patch, right? Here's me eating a cheeseburger. Here, oh, oh no, I can't share anything. Here's me at mission, right? Here's me at mission. Like we are sharing, sharing, sharing. My, my kids, I've got four kids got a senior in high school, a sophomore in high school, a seventh grader in middle school, and a fifth grader in elementary school. And my two high school boys are into sharing reels. I don't know if you're into this, but um, it's a pastime. It's a hobby. And so they'll send me reels of like a surfer just getting crushed under a wave or a horse that is running loose in the streets. And I'm like, why? It's just incessant. It's constant sharing, 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 sharing. It's really easy today to share something funny something weird. Here's me at a pumpkin patch. Here's me eating a burger. Here's a horse running over someone. Why are we making, why, what is wrong with us culturally? It's, we share a lot of things, but are we sharing things that are worth something? I had a mentor say, Brent, anybody can share a good thing. A good thing may be shared, but something truly transformative, man, you risk everything for. A good thing might be funny, it might be easy to send a reel, but something truly transformative is worth risking, is worth leaving places of comfort, is worth, is worth extending a hand to somebody different from me. And Jesus starts to talk like this. He says, take the kingdom, share the kingdom, but not just like flippantly, haphazardly, like as you go, but, but leave places of comfort to come to people where they're at. This cost those first followers of Jesus something. 
Matthew chapter 10, Jesus calls his 12 friends, his disciples together. And he says this, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and then gives them authority to do the kingdom things that he was doing. Drive out impure spirits, he says, and to heal every disease and sickness. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come here. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who, are, who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received the kingdom, this rule and reign of God over your life. Freely give that gift to others. Oh, by the way, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Wait a second, Jesus. I like like the healing the sick part. I like like sharing the kingdom, but this is going to be dangerous. Yeah, there's going to be danger involved. I love this part. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim it from the rooftops. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. And I love this from Jesus. Jesus pulls his friends together and he says, okay, here's the deal. I have brought the kingdom. You have experienced the kingdom. You are praying for the kingdom. Now I want to put the kingdom in your chest so that you can carry the kingdom and live out this good news gospel message that God is king over all and sovereign and good and wants to restore and redeem and reconcile all things back to himself. And guess what? They took Jesus at his word. They did it. They were sent. They went. They prayed. They failed. They won. They saw major victories. They were persecuted. They encountered so many different things. And then Jesus takes the cross, is dead and buried for three days, is resurrected, not revived, because he didn't die again. He is resurrected. He is still living. And in the book of Acts, the first church starts by the power of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people come to faith and the first church begins and they start taking this kingdom ethic of Jesus seriously and living it out, sharing with those who are in need, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God on the rooftops. They were sheep among wolves, absolutely. But I am so glad the first followers of Jesus were kingdom impact people because you and I are sitting here on the central coast as a ripple effect of that kingdom impact. You and I, our people, if we are following Jesus and you may be kicking the tires of faith, this is a great place to do it. But you and I have been called, every single one of us, no matter your skill set, no matter if you've never skated before, you are invited to all skate in this direction, to live in the kingdom as a citizen, as a kingdom of heaven, and make a kingdom impact. Make a kingdom impact with your life. I love this place because this has been so central for mission. It has been a lived out value here from the beginning. I mean, the story of mission started with a few families who sold everything, put a few things in a Penske truck, moved into the neighborhood so that everyone from every walk of life with every past and every story could find a place to be welcomed truly, to be seen, to be loved to be believed in, a place where addictions could be broken, where strongholds could be broken, where there could be community, a place where literally everyone's welcome. It is baked into the cookie here. It is the DNA of your pastors. It's the DNA of this place to live for a kingdom impact. I know Jim talked about this, but Mission Gives to countless, countless compassion projects. You fight for the marginalized. This is a place that responds to real needs. I mean, just from my memory, when the fire rolled through Ventura, this place brought the kingdom. When the mudslides hit Carp, you were kingdom people who responded. When there have been tragedies in schools and in the community, you have brought the comfort of the kingdom. This has been a place of refuge for the addicted, for the hurting, for the tripped up, the jacked up, the uptight, to loosen up. Like this has been a place of belonging for the overlooked. This has been a kingdom place full of kingdom people that brings the strength, the truth, the grace 
found in the kingdom of God to and through and in this city and the surrounding region. So I just want to honor you for being kingdom people. And I also want to tell you that I'm standing here today as a ripple effect of your kingdom impact. Jim shared it, but I'm from San Luis Obispo. Slow City Church started in 2019 in partnership with Mission. And because of your kingdom heart to see kingdom-minded churches planted up and down the coast, um, we've had relationship and we've been able to experience the goodness of God. Uh, Over the past five years, um, through COVID shutdowns and outside and all the political and social seasons, we have seen God do what only God can do. You know that verse, unless the Lord uh, Lord builds the house, the the laborers labor or work in vain. God has built his house. Uh, This weekend, I just got a text. We had a thousand people at church this morning. It's incredible to see what God's doing up and down the coast. Um, And specifically, there have been specific people who have been touched by the kingdom way, by, by a kingdom-minded people. And I just want to share Marco's story with you. Uh, let's watch this together, and then we'll wrap up. My name is Marco Aguilera, and this is my story. I was born in Mexico, uh, Guanajuato. I came to the uh, United States when I was uh, around 14 years old. So it was... Uh, a long journey for me. Growing up, uh, my dad came to the United States. So me, I was 14 years old, I was the oldest, and I decided to just live home. I tend to find them, tend to find my, uh, my family, get, you know, find out what's, uh, what's next for us, you know, because we felt abandoned, because we never saw my dad after he left. Growing up in Mexico, being on the Boy Scouts, over there, you go to town to town, camping, and get to know people. So I figure, instead of me travel alone like that, I just wear my uniform as a Boy Scout, knowing that churches will help someone like that. So we go from one church to another, to another, to another. And I knew something greater was watching over me, but they didn't know who. And leaving, leaving my hometown to go to a better place, it was a, survive, a survivor. And for me at that age, uh, people at church, they were asking me, well, where are you going? You know, and I'm just, oh, just going to the next town. First, I landed in LA. Finally, I got with my, with my, my, my dad. But of course, he didn't want me there. And in LA, we, I was going to church, and this church was open, a group home in Paso Robles. And that's when I got invited to to leave him, to move to Pastor Robles. When I, when Pastor Robles, I met my wife uh, for 25 years. And growing up with no family and have my own, you know, there's a missed feelings all the time about, you know, being abandoned before, you know, not connecting with my own family and now have my own family. It was a big challenge. When she became a believer, well, through my through my experience, I, I I never believe in God that that God can really love us, that He can really unite us, that He can do it. All this to me was just so much anger on me that I I couldn't understand it. I remember where I was when Jesus found me. I was divorced. We went through all the divorce, and basically I lost everything. You know, I lost my home, we lost our home, we lost the small business we have. And when I left the valley, I was coming in a place where I didn't have no job, no, no friends, no family. So I felt like I was 14 years old again, abandoned. And, and when I found Jesus, it was a moment of of angry, I was so angry at the war. I was so angry at my wife, or my kids, and myself, especially myself, and, and God. And I prayed to God, crying and yelling why why he, he abandoned me like everybody else. And that's when I realized that there's sometimes when you talk to God like that, he will answer it. 
he told me that uh, he he never he never abandoned me. That he was with me all all the way along. That I I've, I was the one who did that. I was the one who abandoned him. He told me just wake up. I'm here. So now now I'm a uh, I'm a uh, for the grace of God. I'm with the church family. You know I'm with my own family and my kids is going to college, to Christian college, where I never thought that was going to happen. I never thought we can afford even send them to college. We all go through ups and downs, highs and lows. But the most important is the, the grace of God gives us the opportunity to be in a community to see His love and support of this community that I never experienced before, that I never seen it before. All I want to do is just press how good it feels, how good God is with me that changed my life. Changed my life with my relationship with my wife, with my wife, with my kids. Changed everything. I once was lost and Jesus find me. Mm. And this is my story. <laughs> There's a lot that pulls on us. There's a lot that can distract us. There's a lot that can tempt our affections and our allegiances. And I love Marco's story. We got to know he and his family about four years ago. His oldest son was the second member of our youth group. Basically, they, my son and his son started the youth group together. And he's now at Biola University. And the work that God has done in Marco's life to restore and redeem his, his heart, his life, his story, his marriage has been remarkable. And in a season that can pull us in all these different directions, I need stories like that to remind me, this is the kingdom. No matter what comes in the coming weeks and months, no matter the results of anything cultural or any man-made government, there is a king sitting enthroned on high of a kingdom that we can pursue. We can keep Jesus central and be kingdom impact people. I, uh, yeah. I often think, I often think, what if, what if no one prayed your kingdom come, Lord, in Ventura as it is in heaven? What if no one sought and shared the kingdom come in San Luis Obispo, I believe in the sovereignty of God and that God pulls and draws people to himself. But what would Marco's stories be, story be if there wasn't a kingdom impact that started here and the ripple effects of that up and down the coast? May we continue to be kingdom impact people. It is an all state, all state. Why? Because it's a mandate for followers of Christ. Jesus said this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go. You make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. The world pushes and pulls us in all these different directions, but Jesus is clear. This is the way. I am the way. I am the truth. We're skating together at your pace. How could you jump into this kingdom impact at mission? Number one, you can pray. Make that prayer, your kingdom come, a daily prayer and let your legs follow those prayers. Seek for kingdom opportunities throughout your day. Give, give generously of your time. Give generously of your eye contact. Give generously of yourself. Give generously of your finances to kingdom initiatives. Your return on investment on a kingdom initiative is eternal. Serve. I love that we worship a God who didn't come and stand on a pedestal and say, just look at me in all my glory. But Jesus comes and he stoops down and he washes filthy feet. He sets an example for us of servanthood. He is glorious. He is mighty. He is powerful. But he said, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. And he calls us to follow in that example. Would you serve? Sign up to serve today. Would you send somebody? What does that look like for mission? You're already doing this with interns and residences. But what if it looked like 
even to raise up our kids in the way. I, I was sat next to a dad down here this morning. I'm going to try and wrap up. They gave me a couple of minutes. Um, they had little kids, and he's sitting in front of me, and um, three little kids, dad by himself, and he says, this is how we worship the Lord. And he holds his hands, and he's helping his little kids even understand. That is sending, you guys. Let's raise up the next generation to be firmly planted and rooted, to even head into our schools and be light, salt and light in a broken world. What if we sent out missionaries? What if we continue to be the church, no matter what happens out, outside, no matter what happens around us, that we sent people? What if you go? What if you go? Maybe today there's been a call in your heart to be a missionary. Maybe today there's been a call in your heart to, to be a missionary to your workplace. What if God, God is calling you to go? He calls us to go. I'm gonna wrap up with this. Romans 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want you to know that if you're in the room and you think, no, not me. I'm like Marco. I've got a broken story. I'm angry. I feel abandoned. God has never abandoned you. And he just says, call. I'm here. The kingdom is here for you. I am here for you. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on that name? How can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard of? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach or show them this unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. May we continue to be bearers of good news in a bad news world. May we continue to be kingdom people praying for his kingdom to come and sharing the good news of the kingdom with everyone everywhere. May it be. Father, we love you and we trust you as Lord and Savior, ruler and king over all. Would you remind us that you are everlasting, that you are majestic, that you are eternal, that you are enthroned on high, and that you are sovereign and good, and that you have a heart to reach others with the goodness and grace and truth of Jesus, forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. We put our hope in you. It's in your mighty name that we pray, and everyone said, amen. amen.